So welcome, everybody. This is a session I call How to Make Everything in Your Life Easier. And I want to start out with a question. How old were you the first time that you realized that you were full of it? Uh, I, was, I was 30, and um, I want to share with you that story, uh, the first time that I really realized that I was full of it. Uh, so I was, I was married at the time, 30, but when I was just dating my husband, um, I was working full time at NASA and I was teaching at my university and I was taking classes and I was working on finishing my dissertation for my PhD. So he was always wanting us to relax together more and spend time together, you know, go to the movies or just chill right? But my life felt so crazy. And I kept reassuring him, it's only going to be like this until I finish school. He believed me. <laughs> and the reality is I, I, believed, I believed myself too at the time. So what happens? Okay, so I finally finished school and then he proposed, which is great and exciting. But then, you know, we're super busy planning the wedding. So we're planning the wedding and that is a very intensive process, we're very structured, you know, it's like every Monday night and we each have homework and we bring it back. <laughs> uh, but you know, busy, just really, really busy. Um, we have a beautiful wedding and that's wonderful um, and it's great. And now, well, now we got to focus on the house, right? Now it's all about the house. That's the focus. And we're looking for a house and can't quite find anything just right. So uh, we decide to go ahead and have a home custom built. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done the custom home? I had no idea how many decisions there were to make in that process. It was insane. I mean, cabinet doors alone. It's like, do you want a knob or a pull? Do you want squ square or curved? What kind of finish do you want? Chrome? Nickel? Brushed? Antique? Bronzed? Satin brass? Stainless steel? Pooter? Crystal? I never know how to say that pooter word. Anyway, you get the idea. It's insane, right? So many decisions. Oh my God. So we move into the house. And of course I'm busy like painting the rooms and I've got to make it feel like home. And basically no downtime at all. And then I decide I'm going to start a business. And not like I'm going to leave my job at NASA and start a business. I'm just going to start a business on the side. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the stage, right? This is the moment. Here's where we are. So I'm 30. I'm in my home office. I've already worked a full day at NASA and now I'm working on my business, just working away. And my husband comes to the door and he says, Hey, Laura, Mark and Kelly want us to uh, go to the movies. Come on, let's go. I go, oh, babe, I don't, I don't have time right now. I'm working. <sighs> Come on, Laura, you never have time. I know, I know, but it's only going to be like this until that was the moment. That was the moment that I realized I had no idea what the end of that sentence was. It was only gonna be like this until what? What, till I leave NASA? Because then I'm, oh, I'm just growing a business then, right? Like, like that's gonna be enough of a reason for me to go relax or enjoy life. That didn't sound true. It's only gonna be like this until I hit a certain revenue mark, you know, like that is going to suddenly be the thing that I look at and go, I've arrived, you know, like I realize there's no end to this sentence that I believe anymore. And I'm in this moment and I'm just trying to get my bearings because I feel suddenly so discombobulated. And my husband sees this like sort of swirl and he just looks at me really compassionately and he says, babe, if you're not good enough now, you never will be. If you're not good enough now, you never will be. 
I just felt my stomach drop and my face fall. I felt like I couldn't really swallow or breathe. And I just, I couldn't even believe what that felt like. If you're not good enough now, you never will be. Man, I couldn't believe the physiological reaction I had to hear that. And I knew he was right. I knew he was right. I had been telling myself this story that all I needed was some kind of external milestone to suddenly be the thing that made me enough, that gave me the freedom to go relax, to go to the freaking movies, right? Like years and years of constantly working on that next goal, that next milestone, always hoping that that would be it. And I, I just want you to look at that statement for yourself and, and just pay attention to your own physiology. When you say this to yourself right now, if you're not good enough now, you never will be. What happens? Do you feel any kind of like stomach churn or shift in your heart rate or your breathing? You feel any kind of tension? You feel skepticism, you know? And I, I love this statement and I think that it's very powerful, but I'm also a huge fan of affirmative language, right? And so I actually want to take this statement and I wanted to shift it a little bit. And I want you to notice how this statement feels to you. You are good enough right now. You are good enough right now. What happens for you when you actually say that to yourself? I think for me, it was kind of like this, this combination of like sheer terror with skepticism, which is like a very strange combination. You know, it's kind of like, <sighs> just like this back and forth. Like, I don't know if I just can't even get myself to believe it or if it just scares the crap out of me. And I was like, well, it's both, right? It does scare the crap out of me because I feel like I can, I can point to all this evidence to show you why I'm not good enough. Right? All the things that I'm doing wrong, all of the ways that I'm so wildly imperfect. And then it also scared me because, wait a second, if I, if I believe this, if I believe that I'm good enough right now, then what's going to happen all that, that drive, right? What's going to happen to my desire to learn and grow? And, and so to get past this, <laughs> I actually want to bring you <laughs> to sort of a cult classic which is the film Office Space. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch. Uh, and if you have, I hope that you like it as much as I do. So Office Space, um, basically about all the uh, craziness that happens at work, right? And uh, I'm pretty sure as an organizational psychologist, I think it's like written into our code of ethics that we have to watch this film <laughs> because the last thing any of us ever want is to be like the Bobs, right? Two consultants, both named Bob, uh, who come in and have all these, you know, great ideas about how to make things better. So uh, I bring this up because if you haven't seen it, or even if you have, the point that I want to make here is that the main character under uh, hypnosis, essentially, is offering all of this feedback to the consultants, right? He is suddenly without fear, and he's actually commenting on this fear thing. He's commenting on what happens for us when we're in an environment where fear is the primary driver. He's got this great line where he says, but you know, the problem with that, Bob, is that it'll get you to work just hard enough not to get fired. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not really gonna get fired from my life, but there is something to that, right? I think I can get more from myself. And so this is what I really want to talk about today is this whole idea of what it means to really believe that you're good enough right now. So this is our agenda. I've shared something about me and I'll say a little bit more about who I am in a moment. Um, we're going to shift to you giving me some information about you, um, which we'll do using a poll in just a moment. And then I'm going to walk through three questions with you today. One is, what stops you from accepting yourself? What will make you want to accept yourself? 
And then how can you practice accepting yourself? I welcome you to raise any questions as we go through. And I trust that if I'm missing something really important, Erin, maybe you can just in interrupt, jump in and let me know. So this is what we're gonna do for the next hour and 20 minutes here. All right, so I wanna learn about you. And so we're gonna use a polling tool um, that's called Mentimeter. So you have a couple options for how to do this. Either way, you're gonna want a browser. So you can either open up a browser on your computer, as long as you promise that you're not gonna be multitasking, so it doesn't like go check email or like Facebook or anything. Just go straight to menti.com or you can do it on your phone. If you don't wanna to try to worry about like closing the Zoom window and doing the multiple, you can do it on your phone. So you wanna to go to www.menti.com. And when you get there, it's gonna ask you for a code. And so there's a code here, 9571183. And I'm gonna shift the screen here. I'm gonna shift what I'm sharing. And so you can see these questions coming in, or responses rather, coming in. So we're starting with a question about gender. And this is just because we're gonna be able to segment on this in a moment. So it looks like we have, I think I saw 80 something people. We've gotten about 77 responses so far. So almost all of you are getting into that, excellent. I'll just give maybe another 10 seconds or so in case anybody is just finding their way. And if you are worried about the instruction, it's still here at the top. So menti.com and then use this code 9571183. All right. So I wanna to move to this question now. So this is an open text uh, question. Just how do you define self-acceptance, right? We're talking about this idea of being good enough exactly as you are which I define as the practice of self-acceptance. And I wanna know what comes up for you when you hear that. What do you think that means in this moment? So I've got feeling okay with how you are. I'll read out some of them um, and depending on how much they come in, I, I might miss. You are good enough, love that. Being content with where you are today. I like who I am, confident, loving everything about myself, joy in work, knowing you're enough. Oh, I like loving yourself. I like the question. Love yourself is another answer there accepting my flaws, being okay to be you, you're worthy, not beating yourself up, being content with habits, being at peace with flaws and weaknesses, accepting the past, comfort in who you are, I'm realistic, being comfortable in your own skin, I am good enough, I am smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. Is anybody old enough to know what that is? I might just be totally dating myself. Stuart Smalley, I was very young. Okay, I was very young when that came up, but I'm still very aware of it. It's still very prevalent in our pop culture. All right, forgiving myself, being content with the state of now. You do you mean something to you? Cool, I like that. Holding my flaws and strengths in compassion and with love. I love that. I love the focus on it's not just flaws, but also strengths. I absolutely agree with that. Peace of mind, being comfortable with yourself. All right. Love this. I'm going to give another like 10 seconds or so for these to come in in case there's anybody, anybody's like still typing. These are beautiful. I'll be happy to share these back with you all, by the way. All right. So now I want to know what inspired you to join this session. Uh, so I believe you can choose more than one here. So we've got some options. I want to feel more at peace and less stressed. I want to work more effectively with difficult people. I want to feel more empowered in my life. I want to feel more confident and courageous. I'm just tired of beating up on myself all the time. I, I am really burned out. And so as these are coming in, these dots are coming in, you'll notice that they're color coded based on that first question around uh, how you identify with your gender. So we do have a uh, green that popped up, which is unknown. So if you're wondering what that means, it just means that that person did not answer the first question, but is answering this one. And so it's not effectively segmenting them. So, and this is fun, right? Just to throw things 
throw a wrench in things with the gender norms. We've got female is blue and male is pink. Love it. Looks like we've got a pretty even tie here between I want to feel more at peace and less stressed. And also I want to feel more confident and courageous, but a pretty good mix. So yeah, as you're choosing all of the things that inspired you to be here, all of these things feel relevant to a good bunch of you. So the really good news is I believe that you will be closer to what you want in all of these things if you can use the tools that we talk about today, because that's how powerful self-acceptance is. I worry sometimes that it seems really hyperbolic to call it thing or, you know, how to make everything in your life easier. But for real, y'all, it really is. It's crazy. It's crazy how everything actually gets easier with self-acceptance. So to me, one of the most worthy practices anybody can undertake. All right. And then this question. So we'll get back to content in just a moment. I just wanted to hear from this, from you all about this too. What is your biggest obstacle to accepting yourself? So I only put out a couple options here, three to be precise. One is, uh, there is so much about me that I wish was different. I can't possibly accept myself. Another one is, uh, I'm kind of afraid that self-acceptance will mean that I lose my drive to improve, right? Like that fear of not being good enough. Don't I kind of need that? Isn't that super helpful? Doesn't my inner critic just solve all of my problems? And then there's the third column, which is clearly in the lead in this moment, which is like, oh no, I'm super bought into the idea. I just don't actually know how to do it. <laughs> tell me. And I will tell you, I love that that's the highest, right? Just hit 50. So cool. So keep those responses coming in. So even for those of you that are selecting that one, where you're like, oh no, I totally believe in it. Part of what I'm going to take you through today is what are some of the ways that you might actually still have a mindset that's not fully bought into the idea of self-acceptance, but you don't quite realize it. And then we're absolutely going to get into some very tactical, so what do I do? And this is going to be a practice. So it's like anything else. You know, you can imagine this is the first time that you're like picking up a bow and arrow and doing archery, probably not going to crush it right away, but if you practice it, it gets easier. And as self-acceptance increases, then everything else gets easier. Super cool. There is a reason I am like borderline evangelical about this. All right. We got 73 inputs. Cool. So now, since I'm not a great multitasker, I'm going to pause to get us back here. All right. All right. So who am I? I've been listening to me for almost 20 minutes now. Um, yeah. Who the hell are you talking or listening to? Um, it's me. All right. So I am Laura Gallagher. I'm an organizational psychologist. And psychology is just understanding, explaining, and predicting behavior. So organizational psychology is like, so take all that and just do it at work, right? Bring people together in an organization. Like, how do we, how do we feel? How do we act? How do we behave? And how can we bring those human beings together in a way where we can get the most out of them while also giving the most to them? Right? And so what we really focus on is creating amazing cultures by applying the science of human behavior to those organizations. It's all about like, let go of whatever you think something should be. Let's lean into what we know and are learning more every day about human beings. Let's use that knowledge at work. So I started my career at NASA. You heard me mention that briefly. Um, I, I'm not gonna tell those story because it's outside the scope. Um, but the short version of it is that the reason I had a job working for NASA is because um, in 2003, NASA experienced the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy. So a lot of people think about Challenger, which happened um, in the 80s. Uh, I, I did not work with NASA in response to that. I was a little bit too young, although I've been introduced many times as having come in to NASA after Challenger and I was like, <laughs> really good plastic surgeon if that's the case, so no. So Challenger was 86. Columbia happened in 2003. And it was when the, the shuttle was returning to the Earth's atmosphere and it disintegrated upon reentry. It wasn't during launch, so people don't remember it quite as well. But the investigation revealed that culture was as much to blame for the accident as the technical contributors to it. And so my business partner led the initial culture change and then brought me in with a team of organizational psychologists. And we worked there to help maintain and enhance culture for about eight years. So that's, 
that's how I got started. And then I've been doing this kind of work um, with all different kinds of companies, all different industries. Basically, if your organization has humans in it, this can be helpful. And uh, I've been doing that since about 2013 on my own. So I love improv. I actually did improv in 2017. I did stand up. That was hard. Took a lot of work, super fun. So I'm obviously a goofball. I'm a total nerd. That nerdiness in me is not gonna stop. I'm gonna keep that going. <laughs> so hopefully it's at least a little bit entertaining for you. Um, and I actually studied humor for my dissertation. Like if you want to figure out a way to take a really, really fun topic like humor and make it as dry as possible, study it for your dissertation. <laughs> right. But I will say, because I'm a little bit proud of this and because I'm such a nerd, that I was able to work something awesome into the title of my dissertation. So uh, I looked at what happened when people use humor in a job interview. And the title of my dissertation is uh, The Moderating Effect of Gender on the Use of Humor During a Job Interview. That's what she said. This was in 2010, which was like kind of at the height of the show, The Office. If you watch that, I even got this as a gift from my sister. It says, that's what she said. It's like a porcelain, like this is legit. Like it's not just paper. So yeah, so I love humor. I think it's amazing. I even studied it. Uh, this next bullet is gonna be relevant later. You'll see why. Uh, back in 2018, I actually lived in 12 countries um, over 12 months. Um, it's actually part of how I got connected with you all today because in that process, I got to meet Vanessa, who I think is on here. So hello, Vanessa, and thank you so much for helping make this happen. And then I am the uh, founder and CEO of Gallagher Edge, so that's the company. And I put a lot of content out on my Instagram about uh, self-acceptance. So if you're interested, if that's a medium that you enjoy, um, you may want to follow there because I, I put stuff out about it. And then this last piece, so true story, I have a crate of, of this Lisa Nadi cheddar almond cheese coming. It literally arrives. It's supposed to arrive by 9 p.m. tonight. So very excited about that. I'm kind of obsessed with it. I wouldn't normally buy it in obscene you know, quantities, but there's like a supply and demand issue right now. So I feel like I could probably actually just be paid in that almond cheese and it would totally work for me. Um, so yeah. That's me. That's some of who I am. Obviously, the things that are probably most relevant is that I am an organizational psychologist, right? And so, of course, as a psychologist, I'm going to want to bring everything back to the self at the core. And so this is how we look at self. There's really three elements that are core. Self-acceptance, self-awareness, and self-accountability. So self-acceptance is the main point, right, of what we're talking about today. So when I accept myself, I am okay with my flaws and imperfections and my strengths. And because I'm okay with those things, I allow myself to see those things, which is a, a very important piece of that self-awareness. As I become more self-aware, I am able to see the choices that I am making to create my whole life around me. And I stop playing the victim or blaming other people for what's happening with me. I become more self-accountable, which means I become more responsible for myself, more responsible for my life. And this is my favorite part, more empowered. I become more empowered because, wow, look at all of these choices that I can make differently if I want something to be different in my work, in my relationships, in my life. And if I am not practicing self-acceptance, if I am beating myself up, if I am letting my inner critic win, then I'm going to actually subconsciously block myself from learning about me. It's kind of like if you have a parent or a friend or a coworker or a boss or whatever, you know, past life, whatever, and you would come to them with something like, oh, I made a mistake or I don't understand this. If they would put you down or belittle you or demean you or be critical or judgmental of you in some way, you would probably not bring that to them again. Next time you'll be like, I'm just going to keep this to myself. Your brain responds the same way. So if you have a raging inner critic, like I have had in the past, you're going to actually stop yourself from becoming self-aware. You'll know some stuff and some stuff you won't because it's just going to be too painful because you're not going to be okay with it. 
And as you are not very self-aware, you continue to blame other people for what's happening in your life, play the victim or some other form of defensiveness, which I'm going to be talking about more on Wednesday. And then you struggle with self-accountability, right? You struggle to actually feel empowered to create what you want for yourself. You struggle to learn and to truly grow. So this is part of why self-acceptance is so foundational. So when I don't feel good about myself, and I'm just using I language because I want y'all to hear it and actually read these I statements and personalize them for you, right? So if I am not fully aware of how much I actually beat myself up and how much I'm not self-accepting, then I blame other people for me not feeling good, right? It's on them. I might also act kind of rushed as a way of hiding the fact that I'm actually really afraid of looking incompetent. And it sends this signal out to everybody like, well, of course I could do better if only I had the time, right? And if this is not you, which this was totally me, by the way, I used to like rush around the halls at NASA feeling all self-important, you know, carrying my like stacks of folders and just so rushed, you know, now we're in kind of virtual world. So it looks a little bit different, but same thing can apply sort of coming into a meeting and just all frazzled, right? That's actually, hmm, I guess I'm struggling with self-acceptance in some way. I might also act mad at myself when I miss a shot. You know, which kind of says that whole like, ah, oh, can't believe I missed that. I normally get those like all the time. So again, it's, I'm not okay with that. I feel really embarrassed at the fact that that didn't happen. So it's really important that I act like, oh, that's crazy. Because normally I crush it. It might also be that my lack of self-acceptance subconsciously means that I'm actually really harsh and demanding. Uh, and the fact that I'm not that popular, I'm like, well, I am just really dedicated to the job. It's just what you have to do, right? Somebody's got to say it. Somebody's got to do it. So we have a lot of the reasons why we tell ourselves about how we show up or why things are the way that they are. We want to be able to expand our awareness there. And then I may also, if I don't feel good about myself and I'm not aware of it, then I might not really listen to you because I'm afraid of hearing criticism. So I might interrupt you a lot or I might distort what you say. I might actually take what you're saying and distort it, like make it sound so much worse to make you seem like you're ridiculous. And that's all a form of me protecting myself. So these are all forms of defense mechanisms that generate from a lack of self-acceptance. Now let's look at the other side here. So if I do feel good about myself or when I feel good about myself, because we all have moments where we do and don't feel great, then I take risks with confidence right? I'm not overly cautious, nor am I just throwing caution to the wind. I'm also not completely crushed by not getting support or somebody not liking me. I just, I keep on being who I am. I'm confident, likable. When I feel good about myself, then I can follow directions and there's no resentment. And I can also give directions and I don't feel guilty or bad about that, nor am I afraid of retaliation. That's just part of what we do. When I feel good about myself, I accept criticism and I make constructive use of it. When I feel good about myself, I speak directly to the people with whom I have a problem instead of talking behind their backs. We call that triangulation. It's one of the most toxic things that can happen in any group, family, work, and it's extremely common. It's extremely common. So by the way, as I'm going through all of these, the last slide and this one, Notice what your own self-talk has been. Are you having moments of like, oh God, you know, I totally like rush around too, or, oh man, yeah, I'm terrified of taking risks. Like notice your self-talk right now. Whatever's happening for you, just pay attention to it. You don't have to judge what's happening, just notice, right? And then here's the last one before I move forward. When I feel good about myself, I listen to what people say and I also pay attention to the feelings behind what they're saying. Okay. So let's talk about what stops you from accepting yourself. So quick comparison here between self-judgment and self-acceptance. So self-judgment is that critic voice, right? I had such a mean critic voice. She was rude. She would start pretty much every sentence with, yeah, but <laughs> right? Like, I would try to feel good about something that I'd accomplish 
you know, or maybe somebody would even offer me praise or compliment. And immediately my critic was like, yeah, but, and she was pointing out all the things that I, I didn't do or that I, I could have done or, but this happened or, but this mistake, she was so rude. She's so mean, you know? And then I had this champion voice. She was really quiet. She didn't really say much. You can kind of picture these two personas as like people in a meeting, you know, and the one is like really critical, constantly finding the problems with everything. And the other one is kind of sitting there quietly like, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I actually, I, I think she's kind of doing some things okay. No, no, okay. Right, like my champion voice was so quiet. My critic voice doesn't even just have like a megaphone or microphone. Like she's built full on like surround sound, you know, subwoofer. Like she is loud. And the champion voice is like, right? You get the idea. So that champion voice, that is the self-accepting voice. You all have both of these and then probably others. We all have a little bit of crazy. We have a lot of voices in our heads. And so that's one of the key differences. Notice the self-talk. Notice even everything that's been coming up for you in these, you know, 30 minutes so far. Self-judgment is beating up on yourself for mistakes, for not doing something as well as you could have. You would probably say should have if you were talking from the self-judgmental place, self-acceptance is forgiving yourself. You know, it's okay. Yep. That happened. And I, I'm going to forgive myself and I'm going to move forward. My energy gets to go right into problem solving. I don't have to spend time beating myself up. Self-judgment is often one of two things or both believing that you should be better than others. Right? So like they can make mistakes. That's fine. I cannot. Right. I'm supposed to be better than them and that's why it's okay for them to make mistakes but not me or and maybe it's and believing that you're fundamentally worse than other people right like well no like fundamentally i am awful so you can make mistakes but i can't because i am so fundamentally worse than the rest of you self-acceptance is recognizing common humanity right this is probably the most embarrassing one about me that especially in my younger days, especially in high school, it was absolutely for me, I wanted to feel like I was better than. The idea of being like other people was upsetting to me. So I had this total superiority complex, which is really an inferiority complex, and I didn't realize it. I didn't know that's what it was. And if you'd asked me if I was struggling with self-acceptance, I would have looked at you like you were crazy because I thought I was doing great, right? But I had all of these things happening in that self-judgment column. And it's really, really common. We're so hard on ourselves. And one of the biggest problems too with self-judgment is that we allow the fear of other people judging us to hold us back. And one of the most liberating things that I ever experienced was this idea that people are gonna judge me no matter what I do. And that's truth. No matter what, People are going to judge me. That terrified me at first. And then it became the most liberating thing ever. Like, shoot, people are going to judge me no matter what, then I'm going to do me. Right. And of course, it's not exactly that easy of just flipping a switch, but it's also not that hard. All right. So let's get into groups because I want you all to really start to talk about this. So um, Aaron's going to help out with groups. So we're going to do groups of four to five people for eight to nine minutes. And here are the instructions. Here's how I'd like you to do this. Once you're in your groups, take a look at your first names. So whoever has the first name that's closest to the end of the alphabet is going to go first. They're going to complete this sentence stem and then they'll choose who goes next. That person also completes a sentence stem, chooses who is next until everybody has gone at least three times. So the sentence stem is here. It is hard for me to accept myself when I. So I might say something like, it is hard for me to accept myself when I feel like I have hurt somebody. Or it is hard for me to accept myself when I struggle to meet a deadline or whatever it may be. There's no wrong answers to this, right? This is just for you to begin to grow your own awareness of what are some of the things that happen where in that moment, it feels really hard for you to be okay with yourself and be truly self-accepting. And then after you go around for at least three rounds, I want each person to answer 
okay, so when you are in that place of judging yourself, how do you feel? You know, what is the feeling, emotion, word, or words that really come up for you? And then how do you behave? How do you show up with other people? You know, do you find yourself more encouraging and inspiring towards other people? Do you find yourself more closed off or kind of short, like maybe kind of like snap at people? Like, how do you think this lack of self-acceptance in these moments impacts how you feel and how you behave? So you'll have eight to nine minutes uh, in these groups to go through these pieces. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So um, we are going to now create a word cloud. So hopefully you didn't close that browser. Um, and if you did, apologies, because I failed to mention to please keep it open. So we're creating a word cloud here. You can actually put in three words um, at once. And so I want you to just share with us. You were just talking about this in your breakout rooms, as long as you were following the instructions. So when you're in those moments of self-judging, instead of self-accepting, what are the emotions that you feel? So the feeling words, the emotions. So we've got defensive. Now, um, if you don't know word clouds, I'm not judging you for that. So no fear. Um, the way that it works is as a word is put in by more and more people, the bigger it shows up in the word cloud. If something is only in there once or twice, it's going to appear smaller. So as we build this word cloud together, we're going to get a sense for what are some of the most common, most pervasive feelings and emotions that come up for people um, when they're in these moments of self-judging. So disappointment looks like the biggest one. Um, I know defensive was big for a while. Frustration and frustrated, you know, Mentimeter's not quite smart enough to know like those are the same. So that one would, it would be bigger if it really wanted to be. We've got sad, regret, defeated, critical, imposter syndrome. Oh yeah. Hopelessness, overreacting, fear, humiliated, doubt, humbled, stuck, fed up, harsh, disgust, withdrawn, distractible, lacking, empty, shy, overwhelmed, uncomfortable, lonely, self-loathing, hate, irritable, sick, tired, worry, behind, yeah, avoidant. <laughs> Before a lot of you came back, we were like, this is going to be a real upper, this word cloud. <laughs> hey, happy day. Okay. Have no fear. We are going to get to that. We've got about 68 respondents so far. I don't want to rob anybody of their opportunity to put their words in. So maybe like in their 10 seconds or so. Okay. And then let's come back here. All right. So what is a paradox? Well, this is a paradox. There's two of them. I feel like that's kind of a dad joke. I don't know if I can tell dad jokes being a woman without children, but it still makes me laugh. So yes, I am totally nerd. Okay, no, for real, what's a paradox? So a paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement that actually when we take a look at it a little bit deeper, we realize, huh, actually that might be kind of true. And so paradox theory was absolutely monumental for me in my journey of practicing self-acceptance. It was so huge for me to recognize that self-acceptance and self-improvement were not opposite ends of the same continuum. Because that's what I thought. I can be self-accepting on this side, or I can be self-improving way over here. So if I'm self-accepting, what happens to my self-improvement, right? That's honestly what I believed. And there's a quote from Dr. Robert Holden, no amount of self-improvement will ever make up for a lack of self-acceptance. No amount of self-improvement will ever make up for a lack of self-acceptance. Right? And I felt this so much in that story that I shared in the beginning. This was so true for me. I constantly was telling myself this lie that all I had to do was achieve that next thing, get that next thing done. And then suddenly I was going to feel 
like I was enough, like I had reached some kind of something, some totally artificial destination. And that would be the thing to give me permission to actually enjoy my life. I was really waiting for that. And it was so huge for me to recognize like that bar, that bar is always going to move, right? I mean, you know this experience, right? You set some kind of goal or you're focused on something and that's that bar and you're moving, you're getting closer to it. And it's like the second you arrive at that bar, what happens? It moves, right? Or maybe, maybe it moves like even before you get there, you know, like it sees you coming and it just kind of like runs away, you know, like an elephant running away from a mouse or like teenagers running away from personal accountability, you know, it's going to move. It's always going to move. And that's okay. I want it to move. No part of this is asking you to stop working on self-improvement. It's a recognition that that focus on self-improvement is not ever going to make up for what's happening with the self-acceptance piece. And so this paradox theory, this is my favorite visual for it. Well, that's not true. My favorite visual is the two docs because it's a paradox and that's hilarious. No, but this was impactful for me. I was like, oh, yeah, I can be high on self-acceptance and high on self-improvement. And you know what? I am by far the best version of myself when I am choosing to be high on both. And it is a choice. It's actually a bunch of choices, a whole series of choices that I get to make every day to be high on both of those things. So I want to shift to our second question now, which is what will make you want to accept yourself, right? And so this is a similar format. We're going to go back to breakout rooms. And this time you'll look at whose first name is closest to the beginning of the alphabet and they will go first and complete the sentence stem, choose who goes next. And hopefully you know how that goes. Now this time, this is going to be the only part of the experience. So I want you to just go around with this sentence stem until we bring you back. And so what that means is, especially if you're starting to feel stuck, you know, you've been doing it for like three and a half minutes and you're like, oh, I don't know if I have anything else. That's actually the most important time to keep going. And I don't think I mentioned this for the first breakout room, but I will say this. It's not like somebody can like take your answer, right? Like if somebody completes a sentence stem and you're like, oh man, like that's what I was going to say. Well then say it. Those are actually some of the best moments where it's like, ah, oh, me too. We like that as humans, right? That's connection. That's cool. So nobody can take your answer. Feel free to repeat things that somebody else said, as long as it's genuinely true for you. And this sentence stem is, when I accept myself, I, and the parentheses there is, you know, feel slash am slash do. And the whole idea here is just, what is that? So what is it that you feel? Or if there's an, an M statement there or something that you do differently. So there's really no, no wrong answers to this either. I just want you to think about what are the moments when you are feeling most self-accepting and what's true for you? So person whose name is closest to the beginning of the alphabet goes first starts around, chooses who's next, and just keep going with this. Um, you'll be in your break rooms for five minutes with this sentence stem, and then we'll have you come back. Welcome back, everybody. So we are going to do another word cloud, um, and this time it's based on this discussion you just had. So when you are feeling self-accepting, feeling good about yourself, genuinely, on the inside, what emotions do you feel? So you can put uh, three, I believe, at a time, and we'll create another word cloud. Seem confident and happy, big so far. A lot of confident, calm, energized, peaceful, relaxed, reflective, competent, engaged, daring. Ooh, unclenched. Yes. <laughs> I think I know exactly what you mean by that. Um, energy, empowered, loved, in control, courageous, joyful, stable, empathy, kinder, useful, giving, willing to learn, and peace, clarity, connected, complete, joyful, warm, whole, better, strong serenity. Oh, this one's good, right? 
like, dang y'all for real. I mean, I told you the question that I wanted to go through here was, you know, what will make you want to accept yourself? I believe I can tell you with confidence that I have felt all of these things on both of these word clouds, depending on how much I am practicing self-judgment or self-acceptance. So this is part of our human experience. This, this is where I want to be, right? And I would love to work with a bunch of other people in my organization who can show up like this as much as possible. Right? And this is why we talk about self-acceptance being the key to making everything in your life easier, genuinely. And how you actually feel about yourself is the biggest predictor of how well you're going to do in life, at work, all of that. So, okay. This was great. I love this word cloud. Totally wanting to have a copy. I mean, if I have a copy of it, that's fine. No, I have a copy of this is mine. Yes. I'm keeping that. I will send it to you. All right. Let's go back. Got to move everything around here. Okay. So I want to give you another tool that can help you to start to you know, change this pattern because we all have moments where we are practicing self-acceptance and moments where we are practicing self-judgment. So let's do a quick comparison here. So when I am lacking self-acceptance, this is what accountability looks like for me, right? Remember I talked about self-accountability and the core elements of self. So this means that I've decided there's something about me that's not good enough. So I'm assigning blame to myself. For sure, I'm beating myself up. But you know what? You guys do, right? Get all kinds of blamey. So I have all this energy going into like, dang it, right? Or like, oh, only, right? You know that. Like, it's just oh, that expulsion of energy. I always think about this in the context of two little kids, right? For some reason, I always picture them at like a batting cage. So you've got one kid who he swings and he misses. And he's so mad. Right? He's so mad and he's like frustrated and you're, and you're like, oh my God, like that bat's a weapon, you know, take it easy kid. But he's so pissed and he's got so much energy and he's like, and like the parent or the coach or whatever is trying to like, you know, hey, it's all right, you know, just choke up a little bit, keep your eye on the ball. And the kid's just like, like freaking out, right? That's that energy of like beating up on yourself. And then picture another kid, batting cages, swings, misses. And the parent or coach is like, hey, no big deal, buddy. Just choke up a little bit on the bat. Keep your eye on the ball. Make sure you can turn your head all the way in. Watch it make contact with your bat. The kid's like, okay, chokes up, right? Just tries again. All that energy from that second kid is going straight into the problem solving, right? There's no energy being wasted on like the, ah. So what happens in this cycle is that we have this like, dang it, and the if only, and our inner critic is just like raging. So that means your, your subconscious starts to self-protect. It's like, oh, I don't want that thing yelling at me. <laughs> so we actually start to distort our view of the world. We stop seeing things as accurately as they are, right? We blame other people, we overreact to things, right? So we don't see ourselves very clearly. We don't see other people very clearly. And then we've put all this energy into like being all pissed off about things. So now with less energy, we finally start to work on, okay, let me work towards a solution. And cause I don't have that much energy left, whatever it is that I come up with is still not good enough. Or maybe I got that to an acceptable level, but then it's like, well, something else isn't good enough. And you're like, ugh, it's awful, right? That sucks. Or maybe you're like, oh, that's good. And then like the next day you're like, nope, it's not good enough anymore. That would happen to me all the time. Like I mentioned with my business, I was working on the business and I was like, is it gonna be like some revenue number that I hit where I'm suddenly like, okay, I can enjoy life now. And I will tell you, every time I hit a revenue number that I felt really proud of, within a day, I convinced myself like, yeah, it's not that much though. <laughs> like immediately, it was crazy. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna change these thought patterns. So here's an alternative. To this accountability loop where you can practice self-acceptance. So first of all, choose something that you want to improve. 
Now, this is important, and this is not just framing, although framing is huge. So you're always going to have something about you that you want to work on, some skill you want to develop, some way that you want to grow, you know? I feel confident, especially because y'all are here right now, that not a single one of you is ever going to be like, you know what? I think I'm done. <laughs> like, I think I'm all, yeah. I think, like, that's not going to happen, right? Like, you're never going to hit a point where you're like, I'm good. Stick a fork in me, I'm done. Like, no, you're always going to have something. So why go through all of life being like, oh, I got to, you know, this isn't good enough about me. Like, ugh, right? Choice. You get to choose how you're looking at this. And I know it kind of sounds like the cheesy, like, well, it's not a problem. It's an opportunity. But there's something very real about that, right? The language that you use matters. So we're not going deep into neuro-linguistic programming or NLP right now in this session. The language is huge. So your brain is simultaneously creating the words that you're saying or the thoughts that you're thinking. And it's also listening to what you're saying and to what you're thinking. And so you can actually be reinforcing a lot of the messages that you don't really want to reinforce by the language that you're using. So it's valuable to be mindful about how am I thinking about this? Because you do choose your thoughts. You have to be aware of them to choose them, but you do choose them. I always think about that whole, your brain's speaking the words and hearing the words is like the movie Inception, one of the greatest movies ever made. And I'm not just saying that because I was 15 years old when Titanic came out and fell in love with Leo. Like for real, it's actually a very good movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. So choose something that you want to improve upon. Oh, I didn't even explain that. Inception, right? With the dream world. You know how he's like, you're like creating the dream and experiencing the dream at the same time. It's like that with language. Sorry, I just got all like, Leo, dreaming. Okay, choose something that you want to improve. Then you identify what are the contributing factors, right? Like for sure you have a contribution. If there's something about you or your life or any relationship that you have, you are contributing to it in some way, for sure. It's useful to take a look at that. And you're not in it by yourself. You are not making it completely what it is. So you get to explore that. And then your energy is focused on understanding the situation, right? So you are becoming that much more aware. Your subconscious starts to flow information more freely to you because, you know, you're like that chill kid with the bath that's like, okay, right? Like you are open, you're learning. You're not trying to self-protect from that inner critic voice. You can see yourself pretty clearly. You can see the other people in your life pretty clearly. And then you're like, okay, I feel like I have a, an understanding of what's going on here. So let's move into problem solving and then things get better. And then you choose the next thing that you want to improve about yourself. Like you just keep on going on this loop. The loop is going to happen no matter what. I would assert that this is a far more enjoyable way to be and to live. And there is so much choice that you get to make here, right? All right, so how can you practice self-acceptance? I want to give you very tangible, practical, daily things that you can do to practice self-acceptance. And it is a practice. You're going to have moments where you're still in self-judgment and you can practice accepting yourself more. Two buckets for this. One bucket is thoughts. One bucket is behavior. So let's start with thoughts. This is one of my favorite practices. So it's a practice to take credit. Now, I want to be very clear about what this means. My favorite example of this, let's say that I decide I am going to be a runner. I'm like, I am going to go run three miles. And I get out there and I put my shoes on and I'm like 0.8 miles in and I'm like, I'm like wheezing and I'm like cramping up and I'm like, oh God, I can't, I just can't. And I kind of turn back, you know, metaphorical tail between my legs. And I'm like, well, that sucked, right? So most of us would focus on the gap. I said I was going to run three miles. I only made it 0.8 miles. Jeez, that's embarrassing. Oh my God. I'm not doing that again. That was awful, right? Or maybe you're going to keep doing it, but you're just going to beat yourself up the whole time. So taking credit is focusing on the gain and not the gap. Taking credit is like, you know what? I take credit for running 0.8 miles today because that's 0.8 miles more than I ran yesterday. And that's super important. When you are taking credit, you are acknowledging yourself for progress that you're making 
in a direction you want to go. You are acknowledging yourself for being courageous, right? Something that that would have scared you too much to do it before, but, but now, yeah, you, that was hard for you, but you did it. So take credit for it. Right. And this tends to bring up a lot for people. So you might be feeling all kinds of resistance or are we not supposed to take credit as leaders? Aren't we supposed to like, isn't that supposed to be their mail? Okay. So let's go a little bit deeper into a, why this is so valuable and B how this is different than bragging or being boastful or any of those really obnoxious behaviors that we were probably taught as kids to not do. So taking credit is absolutely going to accelerate your change journey. It's positive reinforcement that you are giving to yourself, right? That kindness to yourself is creating this internal psychological safety. And that is what keeps our brains open where we learn the most. So I know y'all have had some focus on psychological safety. We have the most psychological safety on teams when we are practicing the self-acceptance and being able to take credit. It's vulnerable y'all. If you don't feel vulnerable when you're taking credit for something, then you're probably in a different bucket. You're probably actually bragging about something or like, if it's not like something that's normally hard for you, or it's not something that demonstrates progress, right? That you've been really intentional about, then like, maybe you are in that, like, oh, I'm kind of bragging right now. Now, if you want to just celebrate wins, that can be vulnerable. So just notice, like, how does it feel to acknowledge my progress? And my favorite example of the importance of acknowledging yourself for the pieces on this journey. So how many of you, I'm going to like pull you over here so I can make sure. How many of you, anybody ever taught a dog to roll over? Anybody ever done this? Right. Yeah. A few people. All right. Did you like have the treat in your hand and you're like, roll over. Just do it. Right. Like, no, that doesn't work. The dog's just going to look at you. Like, why are you torturing me? You can't just tell the dog to do it and it's going to learn it. You have to give it that incremental growth. You have to give it the incremental steps. You have to reward it. So first you teach the dog just to like lay down, like she's trying to figure it out. Okay. And then she lays down and she's, she, what do you want me to do? You want me to roll over? Like she's trying to figure it out and you reward that. And then you go like, ah, step further until finally she gets the whole picture in her mind and she rolls over. And then you can just say the command and she'll do it. And then you give her the treat, but she needed those treats along the way. Now this is basic learning theory. Humans are slightly more sophisticated than dogs, but honestly, like only a little tiny bit, not nearly as much as you might think. So we really do need this. And if you're like, nah, I don't need it. I don't need reinforcement. You will learn faster with it. You just will. So that's part of what you're doing for yourself is you are accelerating your own journey here. This is also going to help you create deeper connections with people. And it's because, and some of this was coming up in your answers earlier, we cannot be kinder to other people than we are to ourselves. Can't. And if you're like, oh no, I'm way nicer to everybody else than I am to myself. I would assert that there's probably an element of people pleasing that's happening there and less about genuine kindness, right? So just, just check it. If you feel resistance to it, totally cool. You can email me later. We can chat about it. But this process of taking credit and growing your self-acceptance is going to help you connect with other people. Some of the goofiest things people take credit for have the biggest resonance. I'm running this workshop right now on Monday evenings and there was, a, I think it was last week, this woman, this will show you, there's nothing too small to take credit for. She was like, I take credit for staying quiet when my husband put the Chinese takeout directly on the kitchen table instead of putting it on the island. <laughs> and like my whole group was like, oh my God, like I totally, for real. Like she had determined that one of her values was family happiness. And instead of harping on that, even though it's something she had asked about before, she's like, you know what, I'm going to choose to let it go. That was hard for her. And it represented progress in a direction she wanted to go. And you wouldn't believe like what that did for the group on like both sides of genders in the room, it was sort of like, okay, so as a man who's dealt with that before, I want to say thank you. <laughs> and the women were like, oh yeah, totally. I've had that. It was, it really does create these connections when other people can see part of what we're working on and we get to invite them into that. I mean, we want to have teams where we are open about the things that we are learning about and growing and the ways that we want to develop. We're going to do it that much faster when we're in this kind of practice. And I think you have actually channels in Slack for this. 
like today I, I think might be a really great one for you to use for taking credit. Today I take credit for, and you'll see the kinds of things people take credit for, and it's gonna be awesome and cool. All right. If you feel resistance, it's probably one of these few buckets, right? Maybe others are gonna think this is stupid. Okay, well, so remember what I said before about self-judgment, meaning I'm letting the fear of judgment from other people stop me from just being who I am. Yeah, well, that's what that is. So yeah, I might be talking to a person who's run like multiple marathons and I'm like, I ran 0.8 miles, but it's not about comparing yourself to other people. That is the worst thing you can do for self-acceptance. This is about your own journey. That's what this is about. So there is nothing too small to take credit for, nothing right? Which is really what I like to emphasize too for that last bullet. Like, ah, I can't come up with anything. Like I didn't do anything right. If you're in that last bullet, like super hard for you to come up with something, that's when it's the most important for you to actually do it. Right? That's when it's the most important. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A couple of these Slack channels. So I was worried I wouldn't remember, but I did. So use these. This can be a daily practice and it's vulnerable. So go first, right? Be a leader, leaders go first. Put yourself out there. You will probably see that others are very admiring of your vulnerability and they're gonna love it, okay? All right, so I wanna see, I'm gonna go back here to Mentimeter for a moment. Okay. So I want you to start this practice right now. And so the question here is what do you take credit for today? Now you can take credit for something that you did yesterday or last week. It doesn't have to be something that you did literally today. Although I would say you can challenge yourself to say, yeah, if I did force myself to take credit for something today, what would it be? Making time for this session, Hey all took hella notes for this presentation. <laughs> nice. Getting up at 545, getting up at 545 and not being cranky, baller move. By the way, I would want to be like high-fiving all of these. I know, you know, COVID times and, and everything, that's what, you know, virtual, but like high-five yourself. I just said it like seven times. You're not judging me, right? It's fine. I started a garden for my mental health. So I want you to look at these, right? Keep putting these in and look at these. Ooh, I emptied the dishwasher first thing in the morning for the second day in a row. That's a good feeling, right? Lunchtime rolls around, you're like, empty dishwasher. Stand on top of things, feels good. Picked up the dog poop, yeah, man. It's like eat the frog, like get that thing out of the day, good, or out of the way. So if you're like, I don't know, I don't know what to take credit for, look at these. Somebody went out and ran this morning, nice. Drinking water and tea, exercising, washing the dishes, cleaning the house. Ooh, finished a long running task. It's a good moment. That feels good, right? Getting past that procrastination tendency. Made my son a great breakfast. Made time for me. Yes, beautiful. Wore pants. Show off. Like real pants? Sweatpants? Doesn't matter. You don't have to tell me. All right. Ran an errand for my wife, first thing. Getting out of my comfort zone, these breakout sessions. Yes, do it. Thank you for staying for the breakout rooms. Thank you. <laughs> All right, beautiful. So we've got about 49 responses. Awesome. So thank you for that. If you uh, didn't answer yet, go ahead and keep answering, keep them rolling in. I'm just gonna pop over here because I wanna give you another daily practice that you can do. This is in the behavior bucket, right? So I said, I'm gonna give you like a thought um, habit and a behavior habit. So. I mentioned when I did my little intro that I did this 12 um, month traveling around thing. And so I got rid of all my stuff. I got rid of everything when I left. That was the beginning of 2018. And I, I was going through my stuff and I had all of these scented candles, which I love. I love scented candles. And I had all of these that were like barely used, maybe half used. And I was feeling really sad because I wasn't bringing them with me. That would be crazy. Would it be crazy? Maybe I could have done it. So I was like giving them away or throwing them away. I don't even remember, but I was like, what is, what is happening here? Like I love scented candles and I have so many not fully used. And I realized like, oh, you know what? I only 
would light those candles when people were coming over. But I'm the one that likes them. Like, it's for me. I have, I have one going right now. See it? I realized I was like saving them. I was saving the candles for other people. Like maybe they don't even like it like I do. I'm like a Christmas cookie person all year round. That's what I like. Kayla on my team likes fresh linen scent. You know, like she maybe doesn't even appreciate that. But I was telling myself subconsciously that I like wasn't enough of a reason to light the damn candle, even though I was the one that liked it. And I had a similar moment too when I realized Tell me if this happened to you. Well, probably won't tell me. You'll probably just stay muted. Maybe you'll nod a little bit. Have you ever like cleaned your, your home because somebody's coming over? Maybe not during COVID, but like, you know, back in a previous life. And then, so I would do that. Like I would clean things up because people were coming over. And then I would look around and I was like, I really like this. <laughs> like this looks really nice. I like it when my home looks like this. And I had this moment again where I was like, wait, why am I only doing this for other people? Like, why don't I make my home look nice for me? Because I like it. And now, I mean, my friends kind of uh, maybe make fun of me for almost being sort of like, you know, model home level, like that's not where that pillow goes. You know, I try to not be too nuts about it, but like I make my home look really nice just about every day because I like it. It's something that I do for me. And you can do this with your behavior. So I want you to think about what is something that is kind that you can do for yourself. What you're doing each time you do something that's just, you're just doing it for you because that's enough of a reason. You are showing yourself like, yeah, I'm enough. This is okay. I can do this, right? And so I want you to think about what that's going to be. I'm going to pull Mentimeter back up. And I'm going to ask you what that is. And if you're not sure, if you're not sure, then take a look at the answers that come in from other people. What is one thing that you will do this week to show yourself that you're worth it? Take a bubble bath, buy a new shirt, light my candles for me, candles, hey. Yes, flowers. Flowers is another thing. I, you know, I used to like read those magazines when I was a teenager. That's like, if you're single and you're sad, take yourself on a date, buy yourself flowers. And I was like, I don't get it. Like I did not, I did not get it. I get it now. I totally get it now. It's like, Hey, if I like flowers, I'm going to get flowers for me because they're pretty. And that makes me happy. Complete a home workout. Take time to exercise. Yeah. Make time to exercise. Get out and walk. You know, like I'm going to go for a walk because it's what I want to do drink a nice beer, clean the apartment, allow myself to relax. Yes. And don't like relax where you're kind of feeling guilty. Like you should be doing something else. Be like, I am giving myself permission to relax from this time to this time or from here until I go to sleep or whatever it is. Have a big glass of wine, like Cougar Town Big, like ridiculous. I forget all the names that she had for that. Read, take deep breaths. Ooh, read a fiction book, right? Fancy takeout, pizza getting lots of ideas here. Chill out, sit and do nothing. Sitting and doing nothing is like one of the best things. When we were kids, it was like punishment to go sit in the corner and do nothing. Now it's like, can I just do that? Can I just sit and do nothing? That would be great. Eat healthy, meditate, cook myself a meal, check some of my tasks off my list. Yeah, good. So if you weren't quite sure, hopefully you are seeing some things that are inspiring you and going, okay, yeah, I can do this. All right, let me come back here. So this is, this is important. This whole self-acceptance thing is most definitely a journey. It is a journey. I literally got the word journey tattooed on myself about a year and a half ago. I got this when I finished doing my remote year experience and it was partly about that journey, but it was really more about like, in this life, my focus on these artificial destinations was stopping me from truly living my life, you know? And I'm not gonna do that anymore because the journey is all we have. Here's another daily reminder that I have for myself, right? I want to enjoy the journey. When I am practicing self-acceptance, the journey is so much easier to enjoy. And 
every time I share with people about my tattoo, at least somebody says the band, no, not the band. That's gonna be my other tattoo on this wrist, like journey, not the band, Super sad. right? So because this is a journey, because it's not like, well, I just did 90 minutes on self-acceptance, so I'm a pro, I'm crushing it. I do wanna offer you something that's completely free if you want to check it out. We have a platform, it's Insider Edge. Like I said, totally free. It takes less than a minute to register if you want to. I do five minute videos because I know you're busy. We're all busy, but five minutes. So every week on the dashboard, put up a new video. If that's all you do, beautiful. If you want to check out the whole library of content, we've got over a hundred videos on there right now because I want to share this stuff with the world. That's what I want. So we are just about out of time. I think we've got about two minutes left. Are there any questions that I can answer for anybody? Or Aaron, have any questions come in that I can answer for, for y'all now? Um, I don't see any questions um, unless anyone's trying to type super quick right now. I see one. We do our best when our destinations are beyond the measurement, when our reach continually exceeds our grasp and when we have immortal finish lines. And when we do this, the race is never over. The journey has no port. The adventure never ends because we are always on the way. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and I have my, my email phone number up there. If you wanna reach out to me, please do. I love talking about this stuff. So it's honestly not a bother. If you wanna um, touch base, I'm here for you. I am coming back on Wednesday. I'm doing a session on defenses and how that looks when we are in a place of struggling to accept ourselves. So hopefully I will see you there and hope you'll have an amazing week. Hey, Laura, it's uh, Scott here. Thank you so much. This was an excellent session. Um, it was fantastic. And so thank you for uh, joining us today. I'm looking forward to uh, joining, having you join us again on Wednesday. Mm -hmm.